trust I'm holding on The substance of your hope and love The substance of your hope and love In your hand I'll face the storms In your will I'm pressing on Father, we do rejoice that we can uh, conclude this book, and uh, it's been such a great study for us as we feel like we've been being discipled here by Jesus uh, going through uh, the teaching and then certainly the events of the last several weeks of uh, our Sunday teaching about uh, the death and resurrection. Lord, we, we just pray that uh, these very important words, the last words here in the gospel would uh, would have the uh, the impact that it was desired to have as uh, as your spirit inspired Matthew to to pin these last words and uh, Lord so we just commit this time to you in Jesus name uh, Amen. Well, let me get my glasses on so I can see and we'll. I just want to uh, read read these last c- uh, couple of verses here. We're in verse sixteen again of Matthew twenty eight. Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of of the age. So uh, last week we basically went through uh, 13 appearances of Jesus after his resurrection. And and then uh, some of those, of course, the text would say, uh, and he appeared several times or many times or often. So it's not to say that there were only 13, but this is the last one here in Matthew's gospel. Certainly it's not the last time that Jesus appears because, uh, again, that would be on the Mount of Olives at his ascension uh, there Uh, recorded in one of the other Gospels. But this is a very uh, important one because here he gives us what sometimes we refer to as the Great Commission. Actually, it's a command. I think we like the term commission better. (laughs) Oh, I have a commission for you. Thank you. I have a command for you to do. Oh, all right. You know, so I think we like the idea of of commission, but as we'll see in the text, uh, it's really a a, a command. And um, some very interesting things about these uh, couple little verses here. The first thing we notice is that Jesus assembled the disciples in, in Galilee. Now remember when the women saw the angel there as the tomb, uh, the stone was rolled away from the tomb, they realized Jesus was no longer there. One of the things, of course, the angel is saying, he is risen, he is not here. Now go and tell the others, he will meet them in Galilee. And then later they run into Jesus again. And he says, tell the others that I will meet them, go ahead into Galilee. So apparently this is that meeting that the angel spoke about, that, uh, that Jesus spoke about as, uh, as well. And so it's the, the 11 that are assembled there in terms of which mountain it is. It doesn't really say. Uh, Galilee is an area. It's not a city. It's a plateau. So it, in a sense, it could have been anywhere. Most commentators believe it was probably uh, Mount Hermon, which is the mountain, the large mountain there uh, in northern Israel, because that was the place where Jesus took Peter, James, and John aside and was transfigured before them. So because of the, uh, the teaching that was done in that place, because of the experience that they had in that location, because of its prominence, we don't know for sure, but that's the speculation that it was uh, more than likely Mount Hermon. Uh, the second thing is that it is true believers who are assembled there to, uh, to worship him. And uh, I don't know if those words jumped off to you or not, but some of them worshiped and some doubted. Huh? <laughs> I mean, uh, Jesus is standing there in, in front of you. Which, which part of resurrection don't you get here? You know, it's like, how, how is it that some are doubting at this point? And, and there's a couple of different uh, opinions. One would say that, that uh, it's, you know, of course, we've got the 11 that are there, and, uh, and it would be somebody or some of the 11 that are doubting, but that doesn't really make sense to me, given the fact Jesus has already made several personal appearances to them, uh, and the ultimate skeptic, Thomas, who says, I-, I won't believe until I see it for myself. I don't take any of you guys' testimony or word for it, and Jesus uh, then 
uh, comes to Thomas. He sees his wounds. He touches them. And, uh, uh, and he says uh, to Jesus, my Lord and my God. So I think that dealt with the, the worst of the skeptics in the group. Now, one of the uh, appearances we talked about last week is from 1 uh, Corinthians 15, where Paul talks about Jesus appearing on a mountain before 500 uh, at one time. Uh, and uh, that leads, that's my opinion and a lot of other people, that that's the incident we're looking at here. Uh, the disciples, those 11 are there. Uh, but also there are certainly others there. And I think of those others, though they would certainly, we might include them as disciples and as a believer, they're, they're still doubting over what they're seeing and what they're experiencing. And I just want to say, I'm glad we've gotten over all of that because none of us ever have our doubts or, or anything because Jesus has just proved himself to us over and over and over again. And we've seen it in the word and experience and we never really have to deal with this issue. So we'll just move on. No, that's, that's not really the case. I, I think the words jump off to us, at least to me, and some doubt it. And I have to say, I don't understand that. But if I look at my own life, I have to say, I guess I kind of understand that a little bit. Yeah, because even after everything the Lord's done, I think it's an issue we still struggle with. But uh, in context, Jesus is going to give them this great commission to go into all the world. And uh, what I want to suggest is that the people that worshipped him did it and the people that doubted didn't. Uh, so I, th I think it becomes kind of a critical issue here. Uh, and in terms of how we're doing with that, by the way, this uh, great command or commission, uh, there's still roughly half the people in the world have never heard the name of Jesus and never heard the gospel, have nothing of their language of the New Testament written uh, in a way that they can uh, comprehend it. So... Uh, uh, so the doubt apparently is still a, a concern. Now, Jesus, it's, a, it's a, a kind of an interesting uh, Greek word that's used for doubt. It's used in only one other place in the New Testament. Uh, and let me read it for you. You'll recognize the context, Matthew 14, 31. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You have little faith. He said, why did you doubt? Peter, <laughs> walking on uh, on the water, the same, the same word there. I mean, for Peter at that point, certainly there would be ample reason not to doubt. He's walking on the water. He's doing it, you know. And then again, uh, what, uh, what we see in that context is that Peter takes his eyes off of the Lord and on the circumstances of the storm, uh, and he begins to, to doubt. And certainly that a, a, should be a concern for us as well. Now, Jesus tells a, a story in Luke 16 about a rich man named Lazarus that, uh, that dies. Uh, this is, again, before the, the death and resurrection of Jesus. And, and uh, uh, believers that died at that point went to a place called Abraham's bosom. It was a place of comfort and so forth, again, described by Jesus in Luke 16. But there was a gulf, and on the other side was a place of torment where unbelievers went uh, at, at that point. Again, not a parable because Jesus never used personal names when he told a parable. So it's a story that Jesus is telling us of a reality of an experience of these two men. Luke 16, 27, he answered, then I beg you. The guy over here is very concerned because he's in torment. He's kind of calling a cross saying, uh, can't you do something about this? I'm very concerned about some brothers that I have. He answered, then I beg you, Father, to Abraham, send Lazarus to my father's house. For I have five brothers, let him warn them so that they will not also come to this place of torment. Abraham replied, they have Moses and the prophets, let them listen to them. No, Father Abraham, he said, but if someone from the dead goes to them, they will repent. He said to him, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced even if someone rises from the dead. That's exactly what we're, what we're seeing here. Jesus predicting that even though I'm going to die and even though I'm going to rise again from the dead, there's still going to be people that doubt. What was his issue there? If they don't believe the word of God, Moses and the prophets, if they don't believe the Bible uh, in God's word, they're certainly not going to believe the personal experience of somebody that even rises from the dead. Uh, again, so this issue of doubt is a concern for us because it will prevent us from going, going to all the nations, uh, delivering the gospel to those along the way. 
Now, James in, uh, talks about this issue as well, and he is speaking directly to, to believers in James chapter 1, verse 5. Let me just kind of stay on this up for just a moment because I think it's critical. Uh, there James says, If any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God. He who gives generously to all without finding fault, it will be given to him. But when he asks, he must believe and not doubt. Because he who doubts is like the uh, wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. That man should not think he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all he does. Uh, to be double-minded means you have two souls, and, and there's a battle that's going on. Uh, James is saying that uh, if any of us believers lack wisdom, uh, we should just ask God. He'll give generously without finding fault. It's not, why didn't you ask before? Or why does, you know, there's no conditions Without finding fault, just if you need wisdom from God, just, just ask God. Great. But there's a, the condition is, but if you ask, believe and don't doubt. Because if you doubt, you're like a man that has two souls. Uh, and your experience in life is you're being tossed back and forth all the time. And I want to suggest that that's the experience of a lot of Christians. They have one foot in the world, in a sense, and pulled by uh, earthly pleasures and, and, uh, and self-centered interest and so forth. Uh, and they've got another one in, in the spiritual realm where they're born again, uh, but they're, they're like these guys on that mountain that Jesus is right before them. The resurrected Lord is there. The apostles are gathered around him. He's about ready to give this great commission. Uh, you know, he's been seen for over a period of 40 days and so forth. All this mounting uh, evidence of who he is and what he's accomplished on the cross, and yet they're still, yeah, but I'm not really sure. And um, it could really prevent us from... From, from doing what God's really called us to do in, in this life, which is to take as many men and women and children with us to heaven as we possibly can. Uh, again, amazing that they still doubt it. So Jesus assembled disciples, but there are some that worship. There are some that doubt. And secondly, Jesus had the authority to send the disciples. And of course, it's going to be those that that believe and trust in him and, uh, and understand this concept of authority. Jesus says, uh, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. So he's giving them a command to make disciples, all the nations. And he's saying, and I have the authority to do this. I have the authority to command you uh, that you might do it. Now, Matthew's whole gospel has been stressing the authority of Jesus Christ. Uh, he says uh, back in Matthew 7, 29, that Jesus has the authority uh, in his teaching. And we, we talked about that then. When Jesus had finished saying these things, Matthew writes, the crowds were amazed at his teaching because he taught as one who had authority and not as their teachers of the law. He exercised authority in healing, Matthew 8. Uh, he exercised the authority to forgive sins, in Matthew 9. Remember when the paralytics uh, guy, his friends, uh, try to get in the home to see Jesus, and they can't get in, so they lower him down through the roof. And Jesus says to him, and your, your sins be, which is easier to say, your sins be forgiven or uh, arise and walk. That you may know that I have the authority to forgive sins, rise up and walk. Of course, that didn't go over real big with the, uh, with the Pharisees, because only God has the ability to forgive sins. But Matthew makes it very clear, Jesus has that authority. Authority over Satan, Luke 4, uh, verse 36 and 37. The authority to make us the children of God. John 1, 12. Yet to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right, that word right is the same word translated authority, to become the children of God. He has authority to delegate power out to the disciples, Matthew 10, as he sends them out. And here, Matthew closes everything that he said about Jesus, trying to make it sure that we understand that Jesus has all authority. And I think there's a, a couple of sides to this uh, issue or two sides to the same coin. Uh, one is the fact that if he's got all authority and if we're his disciples, then he can tell us whatever he wants to tell us to do and we're supposed to do it. Is that pretty clear if we, we kind of got that? <clears throat> if you work for someone else, you understand that you're under their authority. If you go to school, you're under the authority of the teacher. I think that the, the uh, men and women in the military get the idea of maybe a little better than others, this concept of authority, because uh, there's no democracy. When somebody tells you to do something, you don't go, I'm having kind of a bad day here, not really sure that I want to do that. There's really something else I could be doing besides. It's not going to fly. Uh, we see this with a, a military officer 
uh, in the, in, uh, uh, in the Gospels here, who's a centurion, and Jesus is, uh, he's very concerned about uh, one of his servants, and Jesus said, <clears throat> well, he, he's healed. And basically, he says, that's good enough for me. You don't need to come to my home because I'm a man under authority, <clears throat> and I have men that are under my authority. I tell this one, go here, and he goes there. He understands the concept. So part of this is he's going to give us a command, and uh, the real the real root issue is, <clears throat> where's our faith in all of this? Do we believe and, and put our hope and trust in Jesus Christ? And then understand he's got the authority to tell us uh, what he would have us to do. <clears throat> the other part of this, though, is this idea that he has authority, he has authority over the world. Therefore, if he's sending us into the world, then we're going with, with his authority. It's, it's going with us. When we want to go and take Bibles in, into China, we have to get a, a visa from the government that allows us to pass through that border. We show them our little passport and immigration. It's got the stamp in there. We've got the authority to go in. But ultimately, it's, it's the authority of Jesus Christ that gets us across the border. It's the authority of Jesus Christ that directs whether doors will be open for us uh, or not. One of my favorite teachers in uh, in um, in school was uh, Dr. James Cook, and uh, he was um, really an inspirational guy. God had tremendously used his life, and he was uh, retired, but he used to come back to Hawaii and, and teach pastors a, a few weeks out of the year. He grew up in India. His parents were missionaries there. He spoke three languages before he learned English. Eventually, he could preach and speak in 16 different languages. He, uh, he grew up with his own pet tiger. He had a little trap door in his bedroom bamboo floor that he could, so he could talk to his little tiger at night. Of course, the tiger got big, and uh, they had to figure out what to do with it, didn't think it could survive in the wild. They took it to a zoo, which um, later in high school then took a field trip to that city, to that zoo, and he, of course, had to go to the first exhibit, ran to see if his tiger was still there. His tiger was there. His tiger looked at him, he looked at the tiger, crawled across the bars into the exhibit. His, his teacher was just like a little upset at that point and uh, wrestled, played with the tiger, totally remembered him like 12 years later and stuff and crawled back over uh, Dr. Cook. He was, he, was kinda, he was howly on the outside, but he was Indian on the inside. Culturally, he grew up in that culture. Culturally, by manners and by speech, by everything else, he was Indian and it was his heart's desire to be a missionary and spend all of his life preaching and teaching in his father's footsteps there uh, in different places in, in India. He prepared for that. He went to Bible college, went to seminary, met his wife, married, all ready to go, went back on a tourist visa to get in to uh, see his family once again, applied for his long-term missionary visa, turned down by the Indian government. Well, this must be a mistake. My family's been here for all these years. You know, I've, I've been here, I grew up here, applies for it again, turned down. Applies for it again, turned down. They would not let him stay uh, in, in the country. He was totally frustrated by it. All of, all of his dreams and, uh, and aspirations, this is what it was all about. Finally, one of the uh, older local guys that uh, had been part of his dad's ministry for a, a couple of decades took him aside and, and said, um, James, do you really think the puny little government of India can stand against God Almighty? He cannot. God does not want you here, or God would open the door. He has all authority. If God wants you to be in India, he will make you be in India. He apparently is sending you somewhere else. The puny little government of India cannot stand against God Almighty, James. And, and he, he got the message. God has all authority to even shut a door as well as open another door. And uh, Dr. Cook went on and established, I think, about 25 or 30 churches in the Philippines where his wife became ill and he buried her there. Later, he was, uh, went to Sri Lanka and uh, served a number of years, uh, established a couple of churches, and they found out that he played basketball in, in college, so they made him the coach of the national team. So he just happened to lead a bunch of those guys to the Lord. 
which was the top university, who became the generals and the politicians in, uh, in, in the country over the next 20 years, many of them outstanding Christians. That's also where his son became ill. And when the medication was sent that would save his life, the customs official looked at him, put it on the ground, and stomped it and crushed it. It would not allow his son to have it. And his son is buried in Sri Lanka as well. Uh, many experiences, but he taught us clearly that Jesus Christ has all authority and he can send you uh, wherever he wants and he can prevent you from going where you want at times as well. Jesus assembled the disciples, but the concern is that some worship and some doubt, he has the authority to, to send us. And I, I want to note that when I first wrote my outline, I wrote that Jesus assembled the disciples. Jesus had the authority to send the disciples. I took the the out because I didn't want us to hear this and go, yeah, those guys, I wish they'd have done a better job or yeah, they did an awesome job or whatever it might have been. No, we're, remember, we're, we've been on the Bible bus here for about a year and a half going through Matthew as the disciples of Jesus Christ. And these words are still just as relevant for us. So let's get to the heart of it here. Jesus commands the disciples to accomplish his will. And uh, the first thing he says is that it's his will that we go to all the nations. Christianity is a, a missionary faith because the nature of God demands it. It is his will that none perish, but all come to everlasting life. And, uh, and as we read from Romans 10 just a few weeks ago, and, uh, and how will they hear unless someone is sent? And so uh, there needs to be senders and there needs to be people that will, uh, that will go. Now, the command is not to go. The command is to make disciples. The assumption is you'll go. <laughs> so that's, that's, a, that's in the Greek uh, structure. That's not even, not even in, emphasized. There, there's an assumption that we would go into all of, all of the nations. And as I mentioned, in terms of how we're doing, there's about 16,000 people groups who have not yet heard the gospel there's over 3,000 languages that do not have any portion of the New Testament or gospel track or anything else translated into their language. Now, we can talk about the, the great things that have been done in terms of, of missions and celebrate that, but obviously there's still a great deal uh, to be done. I just started reading uh, Joel Rosenberg's new book, which uh, a portion of the book uh, really lays out uh, uh, and gives us some more realistic numbers in terms of uh, the number of Muslims that are coming to faith in Jesus Christ uh, in the Middle East which today, which is phenomenal. You probably heard that on CNN, though, already. No, that's right. They're owned by Saudi Arabia, so they probably wouldn't mention that. But uh, uh, you know, there's just so much going on around the world that we, we don't hear about, and, uh, and the gospel is going out. But obviously, there's, there's still a great deal to do. It's God's will that we take the gospel into the whole world. Secondly, it's his will that we make disciples. And, uh, and again, we might put this in the vernacular, while, we're, while you are going, make disciples of, uh, of all nations. And uh, a couple of terms that are interesting here, the term disciple actually becomes the most popular name for believers uh, in the first century. The, gr the Greek structure, make disciples, only used four times in the New Testament, three times in Matthew's Gospel, and once in the book of Acts. And I want to read that verse to you because it's Paul's uh, first missionary journey. And another term is used with it that we're very familiar with that needs some clarification. And that is evangelism. Evangelism is not making disciples. Uh, neither is making decisions. Jesus didn't say, go into all the world and make decisions. It's, and he didn't say, go into all the world and simply just preach the gospel or the good news. It was actually, make sure you're making disciples. Again, that's Acts 14.21. There it says, they preach the good news. That term good news is literally a Greek word. We just say it in English and it, we say evangelism. Uh, in that city and they won a large number of disciples. So obviously you've got to tell them the good news about Jesus Christ, but apparently that's not enough. Uh, there, there's, there's more that we can do. And of course, if, if you, you look at the book of Acts, those that became interested, then Paul worked with them. He answered their questions. He went through the scriptures with them. Because really, evangelism is a process, isn't it? Now, it's wonderful when someone comes along and they're just ready, ready to be saved. 
and, and they want to hear it and everything. <laughs> I had a young gal about Melissa's age uh, uh, come up to me this week and in the shopping center here and say, oh, you're with the church. Oh, great. And what do you do? With the, oh, you're the pa- oh, you're the pastor. Oh, I got a couple of questions for you. Can I talk to you? Sure. And uh, goes on and shares some, some difficulties uh, in life and so forth. And then and then wanted to know what I thought. And of course, what I thought was, is that she should give her life to Jesus Christ and have her sins forgiven and have a clear conscience and have hope in her life and know that she's going to be with the Lord someday. And that would be the best thing she could possibly do for her and for her son and in and, uh, and her circumstances. And that God loves her and he's waiting to receive her anytime she would make that decision to, uh, to come to him. And she was very, very interested and very open and... Um, and I shared the good news. Uh, I, I may be, but I didn't make her a disciple yet. Uh, but I'm, I'm sharing what I can. And, uh, uh, but they're really two different things. But it's nice when we get that and somebody just, okay, and they just pray to receive the Lord. But mo- most often, it's, uh, it, it's really a, pro- a process. <laughs> I think the problem is, is that uh, in the church, we've really gotten away from this. And we basically believe that people get saved through an evangelist. If I can just get them to hear Greg Laurie, I know they'll get saved or whatever it might be. And, and God uses, you know, the big stadium events to reach at least 3%. And God bless all 3%. But <laughs> that's to say that most people get saved because people sitting in churches actually go out and share their faith and, and lead them to the Lord. That's what Jesus is, is talking about here. It's not always modeled in the church. Sometimes we're we're like uh, those 4,000 people in, in, uh, in the Les Murakami Stadium last night watching the Rainbow, Ra- uh, Rainbow Warriors uh, beat up on, uh, on, on San Jose State, which is, uh, they're having a great season. Uh, and in that stadium, there's the ones that are the players, they're the people that understand the game, know the players, they're actually watching the game. And there's other people that are, I'm not really sure what they're there for, they're just there. They don't even know that there's a game that, that exists. You know, we used to take... Uh, <clears throat> go out to the football games and at Aloha Stadium when it was still affordable before you had to sell a car, you know, to buy your tickets to get in and stuff. <clears throat> and um, when our kids were little, and of course, uh, they loved going to the games. What they loved going to the games for was all the confetti that would throw in the air and the band that was playing. They loved it when those guys would throw the toilet paper rolls off the top. <clears throat> you know, they, were, they just loved football. Uh, you know, hot dogs, you get the boiled peanuts, you get the tailgate. They love football. Not really. They didn't have no... They have, at five, you have no clue. There's a lot of people like that in the church when it comes to the great command. Uh, it's not even a concern. They don't even get it that this is for every, every believer to actually do something about going to all of the world with, with, with the gospel. Somehow we've, we've relegated it to a, a select few. But Jesus is pretty clear. Mark 16, 15, he said to them, Go into all the world and preach the good news to all creation. Luke 24, 46. He told him, this is what was written. The Christ will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. And repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. And then the last thing he says in Acts 1, 7 before his ascension. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So what it means for us, for every person, is this. I'll make it as as simply as I can. As a believer in Jesus Christ, it, it should be in your thinking and an understanding that is your responsibility that whatever situation you're in, school, work, family, you're figuring out who the unbelievers are and then you're praying for those unbelievers And then you're looking for opportunities to share the good news, to evangelize, so that you might answer those questions and make disciples as as you go, as you go along your way. And I think sometimes we, we, uh, maybe as a younger, younger Christian, I mean, I got discipled by, by, by Danny Lehman. So I think I got this, <laughs> this part early on, which I'm very, very thankful for. I mean, most half our Bible studies was hearing about missions, missions field, uh, mission field miracles, mission field stories, needs of the missions fields. And we, we got a little Bible study in there along the way. And, uh, and it was a great, it was a great atmosphere. 
I think every believer should pray whether they should be a missionary or not. And maybe God's called you, maybe he hasn't. I think a lot of people never give his second thought. You gotta give a kid me, I got a mortgage. You think I'm going? I think every believer, when they get saved, should figure out they're part of the Great Commission. And there's a lot of different kinds of missionaries. And we might illustrate it this way. If you came upon a house that was on fire, you'd have a decision to make. You could either grab a hose, grab a bucket, and start doing the best you could, or you could run down the street and get as many neighbors as you could to get back there and try to get this thing done. And, and, and the ones that were pitching the water, you might do the best you could to get something going so they have a, a, a supply of water going to them to get the fire out. And that's an illustration of uh, different kinds of missionaries. There are those that are the special forces <laughs> type that are on the front line. Uh, they see the fire, the need to get the gospel out, and they just go. There's others, like Danny, I just mentioned, who, who basically goes short term, does a lot of teaching, preaching, uh, training missionaries to get them to go, tells others about what's going on so that they'll send the finances and the prayers and so forth that those need. Uh, both both are, 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 are missionaries, certainly. But I think that we're all supposed to figure it out. <laughs> and, then, and, then, uh, and then whatever we figure out about that and our role in it, it we've got to have some kind of role in it. Uh, it. We still have an obligation to, as we go, there's a command to make, to make disciples uh, in our workplace, wherever we might uh, be. But uh, very important. So the, the uh, third thing here about his will is that it is his will that we baptize believers or that every believer should be baptized. A couple of four C's that I took from David Hawking. One is that it is commanded. Jesus commands it here in our text. For me, that's good enough. People say, Why should, should, I've never been baptized. Should I be baptized? Well, if you want to be obedient to Jesus because he commanded you to be baptized. So uh, it, that's why as a new believer... It's kind of a no-brainer, you know. Oh, I want to know God's will for my life. Well, let's just start with the, what the things he's commanded you to do, like be baptized. Now, that's a good place to start. Not baptized? Okay, you're living in disobedience to Jesus. Uh, uh, you might want to deal with that. How soon? I'd, I'd like right away, uh, I would think. But it's, it's commanded. Is that pretty clear? Peter preaching on, on Pentecost. Repent and be baptized, every one of you. In the name of uh, Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins. It's, uh, secondly, it's connected with repentance, cleansing, and, and forgiveness. Uh, and let me just say one other thing about that. I think the issue sometimes is if you've been a believer and you're a new believer and you haven't been baptized, you hear this and go, all right, right on, man, I want to do that. I think the problem is if you've been a believer for a while, many years, <laughs> And you've never, it's almost kind of embarrassing. Oh, by the way, I've never been baptized. Can we do this? You know, and it's like, yeah, just, just do it. There's no, uh, you know, uh, 30 lashes with a wet noodle or something because you missed it the first time around. You just, we just go, uh, go do it. If you want to, if you, if you can't wait till June and our first potluck down at the beach, um, then, uh, then see me. We'll just do it on a Saturday morning sometime. But otherwise, we'll, we'll have a great time down there in about a month or so. So it's commanded, it's connected with repentance, cleansing, and forgiveness. Again, Peter says, repent and be baptized. That's why we don't do infant baptism. I think it's very difficult for an infant to repent of their sins. I think we're pretty sure they're all sinners. They're crying in their crib, help others, help others. No, they're saying, me, me, me. Uh, so I think we kind of get that part. Uh, but pretty tough to repent of their sins. So uh, we wait till a person can acknowledge that, understand that, that Jesus Christ uh, died for their, their sins. And that water represents a forgiveness of sins and a cleansing that, that comes to us. Thirdly, it is compared with death, burial, and, and resurrection. Paul says in Romans 6, 3, or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. That water, that ocean that we hope has no man of words floating in it when we do it, other than that adds a little dynamic to baptism. Oh, I really felt the presence of the Lord there. Yeah, I think you did. You might have 
take that blue bubble off your back on the way in too. Uh, but going into that water represents going into a coffin, basically. And then you're raised out of it in terms of uh, a newness of life. And, uh, and again, this is to represent what Christ has done for you already in your life, which leads us to the last C. It's conducted only after a person is, is saved. And, uh, and again, because sometimes well-meaning, well-meaning parents will baptize infants and so forth, but, uh, and that's great. It indicates that your parents wanted you to walk with the Lord. It indicates that their mind, they were doing the very best they could for you with what they understood uh, about the gospel and baptism. That's great. But you still, as, a, as an adult or a young person or even a child, you know, need to make that decision yourself. And after you've committed your life to Jesus Christ, then you should be baptized. The fourth thing that it is his will is that it is his will that we teach others. What are we to teach? Not our opinions. We're to teach them the Lord's commands. So we're to teach them what Jesus commanded. We've got that in the gospel. Uh, in the book of Acts, we've got how those commands are lived out by the early church. Uh, in the epistles, uh, we, we've got an explanation of what those commands mean so that we might understand them and how to apply them to our lives on a, on a daily basis. Uh, and then Jesus is saying that I'm going to be with you to the end of the age. So the book of Revelation tells us about that end of the age that Jesus is in charge of. So certainly, if we're going to make a disciple, it is God's will that people learn the whole New Testament. Which part of that did Jesus use to teach his guys? Oh, that's right. They didn't even have that part. He used the Old Testament. When he's on the road with the two disciples from Emmaus, remember what he said to them? He explained to them what was written in all the scriptures concerning himself. And he was talking about the Old Testament. What's, what's my point? Is that it is God's will that in making disciples, they be taught the word of God. And, and I just want to say that uh, if you're not aware of that, there's, a, there's been a great departure from that in, in terms of our culture and our, our country. I was just sharing with, uh, talking with one of the guys between the service visiting, and he was talking about uh, uh, going to a seminary in California, some of the other places he's, he's traveled, and, and uh, not really part of a Calvary ministry uh, at all, but uh, appreciates it because as I travel, and I, he says, I try to find a church, it's hard to find a place that's still teaches the Bible. Not, not that it has to have a Calvary Chapel name on it. There's a lot of good churches out there still che uh, teaching the word, but they're getting to be less and less and less all the time. Uh, the prophet Amos, I think, spoke about the days that we live in. Amos 8, 11, the days are coming, declares the sovereign Lord, when I will send a famine through the land. Not a famine of food or a thirst for water, but a famine of hearing the words of the Lord. Men will stagger from sea to sea and wander from north to east searching for the word of the Lord, but they will not find it. And, uh, and yet, this is, the, this is the very essence when we're boiling it down. What does it mean to, uh, to uh, be a disciple? Certainly, it's to go and make disciples. And how do we do that? Well, part of it certainly is teaching them about Jesus, it's making sure they get baptized, answering their questions, and teaching them through, through the word of God. So again, these, this group that's assembled, there are those that worship and some doubt. Uh, there's the authority Jesus gives, commands in order to accomplish his will. And these last two things we'll go through very quickly. Jesus promises the disciples that he will always uh, be with them. And the only thing that I, I want to mention about this is, is that uh, we should all take great comfort because it's not a conditional promise. Jesus says, I'll always be with you if, and then he kind of lays out the criteria. He just says flat out, I'll, I'll just, I'm always going to be with you wherever you go. I've got authority over the whole earth. It doesn't matter where you go. I've already been there, <laughs> and, uh, and, I'm, and I'm, I'm going with you. And, uh, and I think it's meant to be a great, a great comfort. Five, uh, Jesus had a plan that will culminate at the end of the age. And that's, that's what that phrase uh, represents. At the end of history, I have a plan for all of history uh, and it culminates at the end of history, at the end of age. God sees the whole thing, the beginning from the end. Uh, he looks at history like, 
like the person in the Goodyear blimp looks down on the Rose Parade and he can see the beginning of the parade and he can see the end of the parade and tell us who's coming and what floats are coming next. Uh, and that's how God looks at all of history. Therefore, he's able to speak to people in this part of the history and tell them what's going to happen in this part of the history. And they write it down and, and then it becomes completely accurate, even as the Lord showed them. And that's meant to be, I think, a great comfort to us as well. And uh, Mark Hitchcock's latest book in the introduction uh, he, uh, about, about the United States, he, he talks about the fact that um, it's like there's such a crisis in the world today, globally, economically. And, uh, we've got North Korea shooting missiles off just for fun and, and uh, a lot of other things going on that could uh, really disturb us. Uh, and he says, it's like people in a runaway bus careening down a, a mountain pass. And as they look up to the driver's seat, they realize there's no one there. This thing is out of control, and uh, we're all done for. We've had it. That is the view of a lot of people in the world today. But for the believer, they understand the same thing. They're in the same bus. It's careening down the same road. There seems to be the same apparent uh, danger, but when they look up front, Jesus is driving the bus, and it's like, all right. All the things that are happening that we see, the discussions of uh, one world currency, uh, the things that are had that the Bible has always talked about, the emergence of the power of the European Union and so forth. Uh, and if we even go back to uh, Israel becoming a nation, establishing, taking over Jerusalem uh, in 1967, we're watching the events at the end of the age. And, uh, and, and those things might be frightening to us circumstantially because of what's going on and the recession and so forth. When we look, we see... Jesus is driving the bus. <laughs> it's, it's really going to be okay. Actually, we're, we're not a wild bus. We're going down a train track, and, it's, and we're, we're on track for everything God's laid out uh, before us. Again, why, why the great command? Why the great, great commission? Why should we follow it? Why should we obey? Because the bottom line is that uh, I... Um, I doubt if everyone's going to run out of here this, this morning and start booking their passage to the, the, uh, the city and the country of their choice and, and, and so forth because Jesus commanded us to, uh, to do it. Because uh, actually he commands us, but then he does give us a choice, doesn't he? He doesn't really abandon us if we don't. I don't know if you noticed that. God still loves us just as much. It's just uh, it's this thing called grace. It's just a, a marvel. And uh, we don't often, we, we never get it to that extent from others, but when, when we are shown incredible grace by someone, it certainly uh, gives us a, a great appreciation for them and a little glimpse of, of the Lord, and it's, and it's a glorious thing. But uh, Paul sums it up this way. There's got to be a motivation for what we do for the Lord, and it can't be simply because he commanded it, although that should be enough. He just died on the cross for our sins. He rose again. That should be enough. But the Apostle Paul says, really, it's, for, it's his love that compels us. It's in 2 Corinthians 5, 14, for Christ's love compels us. Um, I read an article uh, uh, the other day about uh, the largest man-made hole on the face of the earth. It's about a mile across. If you go to Kimberley, South Africa, it's what they take you to see. There's not a lot there. <laughs> Want to see the hole? Uh, which, which, which one would that be? The biggest one. The biggest one on the face of the earth. Yeah, okay. And then, and then it's a mile wide. It's hundreds of feet deep. It's all dug. Took several years. Dug by just, you know, I mean, little shovels. We're talking little shovels. People came from all over the world, they'll tell you. And it was, there was fights and robberies and thieving and all this stuff going on. It was, it was uh, very difficult to, to dig the hole in the, uh, in the earth. Uh, and then they tell you that, um, that uh, uh, besides that, it, it, it started out actually as a small hill. So they had to dig the hill away before they could dig the hole in the ground. And they will, man, what possessed people to do this and to come from all over the world? Oh, it was because there were some kids playing on the hill one day and they were throwing rocks at one another and, and a passerby saw kind of a gleam come off one of those rocks. And he walked to the top of the hill and realized the kid was holding a pretty good sized diamond. And funny how what happened then. People just came with their little shovels and just started digging and digging and digging until it went the largest, 
the largest man-made hole on the face of the earth, Kimberley, South Africa. Motivated. You know, you understand the motivation. Motivation is very important in terms of obeying God, in terms of the Great Commission. Stuart Briscoe says this of, of Paul's comments, for Christ's love compels us. His understanding of the love of Christ became a dramatic, powerful motivation. Few of us will have his gifts. None of us will have his opportunities. But all of us have the same message he received and may have the same powerful motivation. It would be perfectly proper for each of us to say with all sincerity, the love of Christ compels me. I think that's a great way to, uh, to end Matthew's gospel.
lift up our hands Will you meet us here As we call on your name Will you meet us here We have come to this place To worship you God of mercy and grace It is you We adore it is you, praises are for only you, heavens declare, it is you, it is you, as we lift up our hands, we need a spirit.
strength of your love Lord you have come broken the chains of all the wrong that I've done taken the pain in my heart and given to me your sweet sweet love all of my days for the rest of my life I want to Open love. 